Well, good morning. My name is Brian, and this morning we're going to be returning to our series on origins, and we're going to look at Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25, and consider the origin of marriage. The origin of marriage. And as you find your place in your Bible or on your device, I'd encourage you to keep it open this morning. We'll be going back to it again and again. Marriage is ubiquitous and universal. It has been a part of every culture and every society throughout the history of the world. And in creation, God is, has created us to thrive. And now we see in Genesis 2, he's giving us gifts to thrive. And as he gives us these gifts, he's giving them definition and meaning and purpose. In Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3, God gave us the gift of rest and dependence as he created the Sabbath. And in Genesis 2, 7, God gave us the gift of character as he created us as a work of art. In Genesis 2, 8 through 14, God gave us the gift of home as he created Eden. In Genesis 2, 5 through 7 and 15 through 17, God gave us the gift of dignity as he created us for work and he created us for obedience. And today we're going to look at Genesis 2, 18 through 25, where God gives us the gift of relationship as he creates the gift of marriage. Now, today I'm not going to tell you how to have a good marriage. We've got lots of resources in the life of the church. You can go back and re-watch our marriage, ceremony, uh, marriage conference with John Cox, October 6th and 7th, Finders Keepers. Or you can come to the Sunday school class in the fellowship hall with Zach Owens, what God has joined together. But today, what I want to do is I want to focus on the design of marriage. I want to go back to how it all began and think about how marriage is designed. Because things function according to their design. And in society today, in our world today, people are redefining marriage and they're calling it lots of different things and giving it lots of different meaning. But things are always going to function according to its design, right? So if you have a cat, and you say, you know, I want to call my cat a horse. And then you decide, well, I'm going to get my saddle and I'm going to go ride my horse, right? That cat is just going to scamper away. Or if you call your car a boat, you can call your car a boat all you want. But when you take it out to the reservoir and launch it for that first sail, it's going to sink straight to the bottom, right? Because things function according to their design. And so what we want to do today is think about how God designed marriage. Now, God designed marriage for lots of things. He designed marriage for procreation. He designed marriage for family. He designed marriage for a stable society. But today, we're going to look at our passage under three headings. God's design for marriage. God designed marriage for companionship. God designed marriage for holiness. And God designed marriage as a sign. He designed it for companionship, for holiness, and as a sign. And here's what I'm going to tell you today. Marriage is a covenant union that points us towards our final destiny and our ultimate hope. Marriage is a covenant union that points us toward our ultimate destiny and our final hope. So let's focus our attention then on Genesis 2, starting at verse 18. This is the word of the Lord. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him.'" 
So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. As we consider the gift of marriage this morning, I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel, through the work of your Holy Spirit, and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus and him only. Amen. So first of all this morning, let's consider that God designed marriage for companionship, for companionship. In 2012, Brigham Young University put together a study on loneliness. And this was a scientific study that showed that loneliness actually increased your morbidity. It shortens your life more than obesity. Loneliness shortens your life as much as, as smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being an alcoholic. In her 2021 book, The Loneliness Epidemic, Susan Metz says, loneliness is something that people have experienced, as far as we can tell, in all times and all places. Loneliness is perennial. Loneliness is pretty much universal. In her book, she tells of a poll that was done in the winter of 2020. Okay, so this is before COVID hits, and it was t consulting the frequency of loneliness. It was a snapshot. So they looked at the last week as they polled these people and said, how, how frequently were you lonely? 14% of respondents said all the time. 19% said for at least some of each day. 21% said not daily, but during at least one day of each week, right? That's more than 50% of Americans experiencing significant loneliness. And of those Americans experiencing loneliness, 61% of Americans would describe their feelings of loneliness as intense. And 3% would describe it as unbearable. 15 to 30 percent of Americans experience chronic loneliness, so much so that she says loneliness has reached epidemic proportions. And this was before COVID, right? She says it has to do with the quality of our relationships, that intimacy in America is sick. Do you know why we feel lonely? It's because we were created for relationship. Genesis 2 is unpacking the end of Genesis 1. And in Genesis 1, 26 through 31, we see the picture, the big picture of God creating man in his image. Right? And now in Genesis chapter 2, it's unpacking. You have a whole chapter devoted to this. In Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image. In verse 27, it says, male and female, he created them. You see, there's a plurality in God. We sung it this morning, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And that plurality in God is reflected in humanity. He creates us male and and female. You see, Christian doctrine teaches 
that God is triune, that there is one God in three persons, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, and forever and ever and ever, the Father has loved the Son, and the Son has loved the Spirit, and the Spirit has loved the Father, and it's out of that love, out of that perfect communion, out of that intense, intimate fellowship, inter-Trinitarian fellowship that God creates, and He creates us in His image. And so we are created for relationship. It's hardwired into our DNA. Now, as Genesis 2 unpacks Genesis 1, where God creates man, male, and female, in Genesis 2-7, God creates man. And in Genesis 2-22, God creates woman. And do you know what happens in between? Look at our text here, Genesis 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Now, if you've been reading along the text from the beginning of Genesis 1, this would be absolutely shocking. Because seven times in Genesis 1, God has seen his creation. And he's proclaimed it good. And now, suddenly... Before the fall, something is not good. And it's not good that man should be alone. And so God says, I will make a helper fit for him. Now, this isn't an assistant, right? Daddy's little helper. No, this word is used 19 times elsewhere in the Old Testament. And 16 of those times, it's used for God. And three times, it's used for military strength, for military aid. That's the context of helper here. So, for example, in Psalm 54.4, the psalmist writes, Behold, God is my helper, and then he unpacks it, the Lord is the upholder of my life. That's what God means here by helper. And this helper is fit. And the idea of fit is that she is equal and opposite, that she's facing, that there's face-to-face intimacy, that there's correspondence between these two parts. Now, to emphasize man's aloneness, in verses 19 and 20, God brings all of the animals to Adam and has Adam name them. And as he's naming them, he's identifying their character. And it's a long line of creatures that aren't like Adam. It's a long line of creatures that are different from Adam. None of the animals correspond to him. And you can feel the weight of the text saying, man is alone. And then in verses 21 and 22, God answers man's aloneness by literally building a woman from his rib. Building implies careful craftsmanship, that she's a work of art. She's built. Matthew Henry says, Woman is not made out of man's head to top him, and not made out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved." You know how in a wedding, the bride's father walks her down the aisle and presents her to the groom? That's what's happening here at the end of verse 22. God brings the woman to the man, and the man responds, verse 23, and says, This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man right? This is the first wedding. The Bible begins, the gift of marriage begins with a naked man spouting rapturous love poetry over a naked woman. But it's more than that. You can hear the correspondence in the names. Man, woman, in Hebrew, ish, isha, right? At last, Adam has someone who corresponds to him. In other words, the gift of marriage is given for companionship so that we are not alone.
And then Moses inserts an authorial comment in verse 24. Look at verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You see, Moses pauses here to tell you how God designed marriage. He's saying because God designed marriage for companionship, here's how it functions. Leave, hold fast, and one flesh, right? So, leave. You're leaving one family and starting a new family. Yes, you're still connected to your old family. You still have mom and dad. You still have the fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother, but your primary relationship changes. You have a new priority. Your first allegiance, humanly speaking, is now your spouse. Your spouse takes priority over every other relationship. Then you have hold fast. And this could be translated clings to or sticks, right? This denotes an active and ongoing attachment, an active and ongoing pursuit. The idea here is kind of like Velcro, right? You have two different sides. One, one's kind of soft and fluffy. The other is tiny barbs, and they st- I'm not going to tell you who's who. Uh, and, and they kind of stick together, right? It, it's hold, they hold fast. It's a secure bond. You see, secure attachment to be known and seen and loved happens as we hold fast to our spouse. And then we have one flesh. The two will become one flesh. And this needs to be understood in terms of verse 23, where the man says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You see here the correspondence, right? Woman was made from man. So it's two parts made for each other, from each other, coming back together again, kind of like magnets. Adam here is not merely noting their correspondence. He's also taking a covenant oath, an oath of malefaction. When he says, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, he's saying, if anything happens to her, may the same thing be done to me, right? He's saying, I identify with her in every way. So it's like we're one body. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You see, this covenant union is a place where they are deeply and intimately connected in every possible sphere, personally, spiritually, economically, privately, publicly, and it's held together by a covenant oath, right? They're still two people, but they're covenantally bound together. And in a covenant, it's, it's kind of like a triangle, right? They're not only bound to each other, but in the covenant, they're also bound to God. And so in this way, marriage reflects the interpersonal covenant union of the Trinity. One God in three persons. Now, there's more to this one flesh union, but we'll come back to that later. You could say we'll have to flesh that out later. So, we are created for marriage. We're created for relationship, and marriage is created for companionship. But marriage isn't God's only solution for relationship. In fact, the loneliest place that you can be is in a bad marriage where you're known and not loved, where you're rejected and isolated, and you relate to the world out of a position of weakness and emptiness. Even in a good marriage, you need to have other significant quality friendships. You see, society today is telling us that we should get all of our relational needs met in our spouse. But if you do that, 
you'll end up sucking each other dry. One person can't bear the burden of providing all of your relational needs. You'll crush them. You see, a healthy marriage is filled up on the friendship of God first, then the friendship of your spouse, and thirdly, on the friendship of community and neighbors and the body of Christ. You see, God also provides the body of Christ for companionship. And the body of Christ is also a covenant union where we are connected to one another, where we become a new family. One of the polls in Susan Metz's book demonstrated that practicing Christians felt less lonely. Those who have no faith, 31% of them reported loneliness, significant loneliness. For non-practicing Christians, it was fewer. 21% of non-practicing Christians felt lonely. But only 16% of practicing Christians felt lonely. Do you know why? Church does things that doctors actually prescribe. They'll write it out on their prescription pad, right, for loneliness. The church does things like group singing, community service, being a part of a community that meets in person, providing confidants and confessors, having people you can call on in an emergency. You see, the body of Christ is a place where you can be seen and known and loved. Did you know that Christianity was the first religion in the history of the world to validate singleness? Why? Because Jesus was single. Jesus, the perfect God-man, never married. He had deep, intimate friendships, but was single all of his life. And he is the model for thriving and flourishing. You see, you don't need to be married in order to thrive. In fact, Paul talks about the benefits of singleness, that you can be more deeply connected in the body of Christ. And Jesus teaches that we will not be married in heaven. We will not be married in heaven. Which leads us to our second point, that God designed marriage for holiness. People get married for lots of reasons. The top reason uh, that you, you scour the internet, the top reason it comes up is love. So this is where we should say, love, to love, is what brings us together today, right? But marriage is also, people also get married for companionship, for security, for children. Social norms was one of the reasons given for getting married. And religion. How many of you got married for religion? Oh, that, right. um, but as I scoured the internet, no one suggested that you should get married for holiness. But that's exactly the reason that's given here in the text. Marriage is designed for your holiness. Now, to see this, you need to understand the therefore of verse 24. So look at verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, right? Therefore, marriage. Well, what does the therefore respond to? It's responding to verse 23, that there's correspondence. Adam says, this is at last bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's correspondence there. But in order to understand that correspondence, you need to go back to the problem of 2.18. It's not good for man to be alone. But what's the context of Genesis 2.18? What is it that brings God to the point where he says it's not good for man to be alone? Well, in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, you have a command that's given. Look at Genesis 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And those two verbs, to work and to keep, Work could also be translated worship or serve, and keep can also be translated guard and protect. And this language is temple language. It's language that's used in the Old Testament of the priests who work and guard the temple in the worship of God. 
Because you see, the garden is the sanctuary of God. It's the temple before the temple, right? God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. It was the place of God's presence. And Adam is a priest who's supposed to guard the temple. He's supposed to defend it from evil. And by the way, when he fails, do you remember what happens? In Genesis 3, 24, after the fall, God places a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to what? To guard. It's the same word. To guard the way to the tree of life. You see, that's Adam's priestly duty. How is Adam supposed to do this? How is Adam supposed to guard the temple, to guard the sanctuary of God? We'll keep reading. Look at Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You see, Adam is supposed to guard God's sanctuary. He's supposed to protect it from evil by obeying the command. And that command not to eat from the knowledge of the tree of the good and evil is not a command in isolation. It's a command in representation. It reflects the whole moral law. In other words, Adam is supposed to fulfill his priestly duties and obey the moral law. And by the way, when the first Adam fails, there is a second Adam. And this second Adam fulfills this priestly duty and guards God's sanctuary and defends it from evil by upholding the whole moral law. And so it's in that context that God says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. You see, God sees the task of defending the sanctuary from evil by obeying the command. And he's like, dude's going to need some help, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm going to send him some military aid. I'm going to send him strength. I'm going to send him a helper. You see, it is not good for man to be alone. It's not just about companionship. It's also about holiness. Do you see what God is saying about the purpose of marriage? Why should man and woman become one flesh? Man and woman should become one flesh to worship and serve, to guard the sanctuary, to obey the commands of God. In other words, the purpose of your marriage is holiness. Think about that for a minute. That should revolutionize your view of marriage. You should never think about marriage the same way again. The purpose of your marriage is holiness. The purpose of your marriage is obedience. The purpose of your marriage is worship. You see, it's not good for man to be alone in his priestly duties. It's not good for man to be alone in worship. It's not good for man to be alone in obedience. So if you're married, how are you helping your spouse to be more holy? And if you're single, are you looking for a spouse who will help you be more holy? That's the purpose of marriage, holiness, obedience, and worship. But God also created marriage as a sign so the, the Bible begins with a wedding and, and the gift of marriage designed for your companionship and for your holiness, but it's also a sign. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 quotes Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then referring to the covenant of marriage, Paul says, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. In other words, Paul is saying that marriage was created as a sign. When I was growing up in Maryland, uh, my grandparents lived in Florida, 
And so we would frequently travel I-95 and drive down to visit them in Florida. And there, there's this particular kind of cheesy hotel resort just south of the North Carolina, South Carolina border uh, that's called South of the Border, right? There's this Mexican uh, feel to it. But the thing you need to know about South of the Border is they have on I-95, they have 175 signs. So as you're driving south on, on I-95, you encounter about 90 signs, and every one of them is different, right? So uh, it'll start with like smash hit, and they actually take a crashed car and put it on the billboard, right? Smash hit, south of the border. You never sausage a place with a big hot dog on it right? You never sausage a place. South of the border, right? Keep yelling, kids, they'll stop. South of the border, right? Do you know why there are so many signs? <laughs> because they have a lot of money to spend, apparently. Do you know why there are so many signs? They don't want you to miss this little, uh, this little resort. They want you to stop and buy fireworks um, there, right? Paul is saying that marriage is a sign, and it's pointing towards the relationship between Christ and his church, because God doesn't want you to miss this. And this shouldn't surprise us, because throughout the Old Testament, you have the theme of God as the lover of his people. He's the husband of his people. Take, for example, the book of Hosea. And so when God's people commit idolatry, Right? When they go and worship other gods, it's considered a breach of the marriage covenant between God and his people. Idolatry becomes treated like, is seen as, adultery. Marriage is a sign. It's pointing to God's relationship with his people. And so good marriages with all that joy and intimacy and delight, are designed to point you to who God wants to be for you as the lover of your soul. You see, marriage is supposed to be a covenant where you can be completely known and unconditionally loved, where you can be vulnerable in every way and never forsaken, where you can mess up and fail and be forgiven. Marriage is supposed to be a covenant where you are always safe, and cared for and loved, where someone always has your back, where your spouse will sharpen you and make you the best possible version of your glory self. And that's the kind of relationship that God wants with you. Marriage is a sign. So let's go back then to this one flesh union. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And one flesh here is also referring to sexual union. It's the consummation of the covenant union. One scholar calls sex covenant glue. And in case you miss the subtlety of the text, it goes on, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So Moses could have said in verse 24 here, hold fast to his wife, and they'll have a lot of kids, and therefore they'll fulfill the cultural mandate of verse 28, and they'll populate the earth, right? But he doesn't. And Moses could have said, hold fast to his wife, and they shall love each other deeply, and know more about the love of God as a relational being because of the institution of marriage. But he doesn't. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So if marriage is a sign that points to God's relationship with his people, then the sexual intimacy of one flesh should teach us something about God's relationship with his people. Now we need to be very careful here, right? In no way is God's relationship with his people sexual, ever. We, we don't want to end up with Baal and Asherah and fertility cults. But if God created marriage, 
to teach us about his love for his people. And here, at the institution of marriage, God points to the sexual intimacy of one flesh. Then we need to ask, what does the sexual intimacy of one flesh teach us about God's relationship with his people? You see, Tim Keller and C.S. Lewis argue that sexual intimacy in marriage points to heavenly intimacy with God. Let me say that again. Sexual intimacy in marriage points to heavenly intimacy with God. Again, I can't state it strongly enough. We don't want to take this analogy too far. Our intimacy with God in heaven is not physical or sexual, but here's the thing. Our intimacy with God in heaven is so beautiful so cosmic, so mind-blowing, so utterly incomprehensible, that in order to help us capture even a glimpse of this heavenly intimacy with God, God gave us sex within marriage. Sexual intimacy in marriage gives us a picture of the intensity of the joy and intimacy of heaven. It points to the absolute riches of intimacy that we'll have with God in the new heavens and the new earth. Sexual intimacy within the confines of a faithful marriage, you could say, is a little glimpse of heaven on earth. That's why sex is so supercharged and so powerful. It points to something otherworldly. That's why our culture is so fascinated with it, why songs are written about it, why advertising uses it, and why, when it's misused, it can be so destructive. Sex, this near cosmic experience, is part of the bigger story, part of the meta narrative of redemption with God as the lover of his people. And this is why there's no marriage in heaven. This is why there's no sex in heaven. Because when you've arrived at the destination, you no longer need the sign. How is this connected to the purpose of holiness in marriage? Well, wouldn't that picture of the beautiful, cosmic, mind-blowing intimacy that we will have with our Creator, Redeemer, God in heaven, wouldn't that spur you on to obedience? Wouldn't the anticipation of the utterly incomprehensible intimacy with God that awaits us in heaven spur you on to holiness? That glimpse of heaven on earth, wouldn't that spur you on to worship? Do you see the connection? Sex, in the proper confines of a faithful marriage, in that covenant union, points to what awaits us in glory. Can you see how that would motivate God's people to obey his commands? Can you see how that would spur us on to holiness? So the Bible begins with a wedding. But did you know that the Bible also ends with a wedding? In the book of Revelation, at the end of all things, in the midst of the new heavens and the new earth, with the new Jerusalem, where there is no more night, and God has wiped away every tear from our eyes, and there is no more death and mourning or pain or crying, in the midst of it all, there's a wedding. And it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, the pageantry of every wedding with the bride looking radiant, dressed in white, processing down the aisle to beautiful music, and then you turn, right, and you look at the groom, and you see his delight and his exuberance, right, his exceeding joy. It's a picture. It's a sign. It's pointing to the wedding supper of the Lamb where one day we will be presented radiant and without blemish to our Savior who delights in us with exceeding joy. Do you know why marriage is ubiquitous and universal? Why it's been in every culture and every society in the history of the world? God created marriage to show you the kind of relationship that He wants with you, 
He doesn't borrow a pre-existing institution. God creates marriage. And he creates marriage to say to you, I want to love you. I want to love you intimately. I want to love you faithfully and tenderly. I want to love you forever. And with every marriage and at every wedding, Jesus is giving an invitation. He's saying, at the end of time, there's going to be a marvelous wedding and an amazing party. Would you be my bride? You see, marriage is a covenant union that points us towards our final destiny and our ultimate hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to see marriage as a portrait of the riches and intimacy that we will have with you in heaven, with marriage being an invitation uh, as we come to the table, an invitation to be seen and known and loved because you long to be the lover of our souls. Prepare us now for this sacrament. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.